God, it's Geeter. Thanks for taking my call today. I know you're busy. You got a real special one joining you. I wanted to give you and all the angels in heaven a proper introduction for our dear friend, the one and only Eric Zahn, AKA Cookie Robinson, AKA the Road Dog. Now God, I know you love the right side, which is great. You're gonna feast all day when your new left cider sets you the deep dish nectar from the snow white clouds in paradise. And God, he can play all day, every day. So when you get tired, send him to the net. He wanted a van as a blocker just to prove he could do it. He fell in love with volleyball at the age of 14. He was an all-state baller for the Cherry Hill East High Cougars. He was the conference scholar athlete of the year when he was a junior at Limestone College in South Carolina. He joined the NVL in 2014. Al B. Hanneman said the first time he laid eyes on him siding out, he knew this young man was going to be special. He won Rookie of the Year in 2014, Breakthrough Athlete of the Year in 2015, including three titles. And then it happened. All the hard work, sweat, tears, and dreams paid off as he made the AVP Tour. In 2017, he was named the AVP Rookie of the Year. He finished third in San Francisco. He once went to China for an FIVB event and did not spend a single dollar. That's what we call winning. He's a gnarly competitor, God. Just know that. He does things his way and doesn't care what people think. And tell our boy, the great Danny A. Paul, reffing in heaven, not to get cute with those red cards because Cookie Robinson don't don't play. He'll rip those out of his hands and throw it to the crowd. The beauty, the beauty of the road dog was how he lived his life and how he treated others with a smile and a sweet soul that didn't judge or tear others down. But he didn't smile in photos, no, because that's a sign of weakness. In 2016, he bought a Sprinter van for $4,500. He drove it from Jersey to Cali. He would set up scrimmages and sleep at the beach because he hated being late. He was obsessed with 99 cent store produce. He shopped exclusively at thrift stores. He always wore a fur coat out at night because that's what ballers do. His partner Avery said it best, my lord. He operated on passion. He liked to listen to James Taylor and he liked to get to the beach early and train because nobody ever accomplished shit standing around. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and our heavenly father and all the angels in heaven, can I get a witness? I want you on your feet as we welcome into the gates of heaven out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the ultimate road dog, the one and only Eric Zahn. I'm panicking, I'm bad at this stuff. How's it going? Uh, my name's Eric Zahn. Eric Zahn was the kind of guy that you knew who he was before you knew him. He started coming down, a, straight out of the van down to Huntington Beach, playing at the pier, and uh, immediately made his presence known by just being the most brash motherfucker of all time. Oh, Randy! Yeah! And I just remember like this guy walks out on the court like totally dressed with stuff from the thrift store, right? I'm like, who's this guy with like the thrift store clothes and super fiery, like screams so loud on his jumpsuit, <laughs> tons of energy. I think I met him randomly in uh, Huntington Beach one time. He just kid rolled up flying and hammering. We're like, Ed, who's this kid you found, dude? He's a baller and he's scooping. He's a tall defender that can move and have a ton of range. And so that kind of situation is always cool and like kind of gnarly at the same time. He's like, oh great, another like, gnarly kid that could probably do some damage. So you're like fired up to see some some new blood, but at the same time you're like, uh-oh, like one more guy, I gotta worry about playing. And, and then by the end of it, I was like, whoa, this guy's good. Like this guy's the real deal. And then I learned later, like, oh, that's Eric Zahn. He's been crushing the NBL. East Coast guy who's coming on hot. He's only like 22, 23 years old at that time. We played six man together for a couple of years and we won two six mans together. And he was one of our outsides. And some of the most random things he would say after putting a ball away were unbelievable. I mean, and then going into dance moves and making fun of you like Casey, you know what I mean? Like just all of these things that the kid was, had so much good, positive, fun, random energy. Where you just didn't know what to expect. Like what's around the corner? I don't know what song I'm gonna do if he kills this ball. Like we we're all kind of like waiting for it, you know? And to have a guy like that on a team and, and to be uh, that, that positive vibe, good energy guy that was just, here for a good time and love the game. You could tell I just love volleyball, dude. And it was like looking at a younger version of yourself. Training in Brazil and the US are kind of different. Like in Brazil, you can have two, three, four coaches and two players. 
So we had that and it was like super intense. It was like 90, 100 degrees, full humidity, it's like peak summer. So we'd have like, even a 45 minute practice is like gnarly, you're exhausted, but we'd have an hour and a half, two hour practice and it's like, all right, wipe, done for the day, maybe gym in the afternoon. And like literally within a week, he had already found his own coach over in Copacabana. So we'd train in the morning at Ipanema and he would go from practice to the practice in Copacabana and then go get like an extra lift session at night. Sometimes we do three or four sessions a day. I was like, dude, I love the enthusiasm, but like let's tone it down a little bit because he was like 150%, dude, just like no stopping him above and beyond, especially in the, like those conditions. Like you don't even want to go outside and he was training for six, seven, eight hours a day or something. It was absurd. And biking everywhere in between on this crappy old bike. There's this video that I, I have that a lot of people have sent me lately too that is just this video of him running in circles around the stadium like showing love to everybody and uh, yeah I, I, it hurts I think about that and like the joy that was in his heart when he came to hug me and you can see in this video that the ball goes out and the first thing he does is open his arms to me like this and starts coming towards me and when I watched that on video I that like it's like you know he he, he he loved people, he, you know, he loved me and, and I loved him too. And I remember giving him a hug and telling him like, dude, I love you, this is awesome. And he, you can see in that hug, you know, how cool it was. And then he shook hands, but then he just busted it and starts running around that edge. And he's just so happy and he made everybody so happy that day. And everyone up there in Seaside fell in love with him. I'm grateful to him for that memory. And I will definitely never forget that when I think about my boys on. So one thing Eric was amazing at was planning trips and I was like so astounded because he was so organized like he would just get it in his mind like okay we're gonna go to Joshua Tree this weekend and it would be like the itinerary was just packed and he had like the coolest Airbnb and just like every fun thing you could imagine and it would be like 15 activities every day. He really wanted to get out there whenever whenever you're internationally. He's like, let's learn a scooter. He's like, I've looked some things up. I've done some independent research. He's like, there's like a, you know, a cliff that we can go see. And he, he, he impressed me thoroughly. He looked up the, these tide pools and he looked up the local tides to see whenever they would be best. And I said, Eric, you just, you went to another level with me that you understood that the tides of the tides pool need to be within this range. And he liked to kind of play like, oh, I don't know too much. And he was, he was very smart. We went to Rio with him for six, seven weeks, and that was a trip. Then I had to go play a Brazilian tournament, so I was gone for like four or five days, so he was solo. We thought I'd give him a little land, like that was a supermarket, a couple good restaurants, this kind of way to the beach. And by the time I get back, I was like, so how was it? Like, you get a feel from the neighborhood or whatever? And he had like literally gone all over the entire city, like biking, like Copacabana at night, like going to the city center, like over by the Hilton, the other side of town, like right where everyone gets mugged. I'm like, dude, like his whole thing was road dog and like I thought I was a road dog. Like he lived in the van, I lived on a sailboat when I first came out and like he like put me to shame. Like I felt like such a little, uh, I don't know, like a little princess compared to him. Like he was just doing it so hardcore. Played a lot together, man, and ended up traveling a lot together. Actually, my bad, I gotta back up. The first tournament we ever played together was uh, grass in Pottstown. And it was a couple years ago when we both lost in Seattle on the first day. And then he's like, yo, you wanna jump on a flight and we fly all night, we can go play in Pottstown, starts tomorrow morning. I was like, yeah, I don't wanna sit around, I wanna go play volleyball, didn't even think it through. So I jumped on a plane and we flew all night to Newark, New Jersey. Zon's dad picks us up. I didn't have any shoes, so his dad had like five pairs of shoes from Ross <laughs> in the back of the car. So we take like a 45 minute nap in the back of his dad's sedan, roll up to Pottstown Rumble, and like get out, put our stuff down, and like go start playing grass. That was actually the first time I played with Eric Zahn and like road dogged with him in the gnarliest way. Uh, I first met Zahn, I met him once at Navy P Next, but that was the only time. And then I really got to know him on our 10 day snow volleyball trip to Europe, where we had a couple days off between tournaments, and us girls chose to take a train to Venice be smart about it and he was kind of the catalyst for all the boys to take a stick shift rental and drive to Venice. Eric actually wanted to go to like 
Greece and like he wanted to go to all these super far spots and Chase and like Travis the more like logical thinking guys were like well we only have like 36 hours so like maybe we shouldn't like travel super far but we all kind of settled on Venice just as like a fun spot and to keep it super interesting he was like we gotta drive then and the girls were like we're out like we don't know how to drive stick like we're gonna take an easy train let's just get there which for us we have no idea why they'd want to do that but to Eric, it was just an adventure and off the beaten path, just doing something different. And I think that kind of defines him. He wasn't scared of doing um, kind of the unthinkable, unimaginable. I couldn't imagine driving a six tip, not knowing how across Europe, but that was just him. And he was always excited to kind of be that unique one and just do something different. It was super funny because Eric was texting me like, hey, come to Sunset on the bridge. Like, we're gonna meet there, meet us there. And we walk up to this bridge and it's like this beautiful sunset and they're just surrounded by cops. And we are like, what is going on? Like, are you serious? We just, first thing we see of them. And we're like, what did you guys do? And they're like, we threw a football. And Eric always brings a football wherever he goes. And he told me one time that he does that because it just can make anything that's not fun, fun. When I go into a store, like Walmart, like a store that might have a ball, first thing I do is go get that ball. And then I'm just so much more fun, my shopping experience. Right? Yeah. What I love too is he was super thrifty, like with the thrift store shopping and like never spending money on like your everyday item. But then on these trips, he always told me like I could care less about money on these trips because like if you're making memories with like money that you earn then that's like the best way to go. So we would always just do like these super fun things like jet ski or things that like most people probably would like Eric Zahn would never spend money on that but he would and that was kind of his perspective on like money and finances. We played in China together. Uh, it was super last minute. I didn't know I was going to China until the day before. He is grabbing all my stuff to go to the Chinese consulate to get my Chinese visa the day before. I'm going to a job interview and I just, that night, he buys my flight and is like, hey, we're going to China, like tonight, not tomorrow, tonight. And so I'm sitting in the airport and we make a pact in the airport that we're not gonna spend any money in China, just the road dog experience. So we're flying and they give like sandwiches for the flight since it's a long flight and we just went through the whole airplane like when everybody left and just picked up all the sandwiches that weren't eaten. And so we have like five or eight sandwiches on our backpack. We keep begging the stewardess for bottles of water. And we did it. We played a whole FIVV and we spent zero money. Just lived off of free food in <laughs> the hotel. It was the ultimate road dog experience and it was like one of the funnest times I've ever had. I think some of my favorite stories are like a before training and he would talk about the hotel that had the raddest like breakfast that he snuck in somehow. He's like, oh yeah, no, I went to the Hilton over off Rosecrans or whatever, and dude, the breakfast is amazing. Oh, the bacon there is like unbelievable. It's like he'd go there for the bacon, and then he'd go over to, you know, whatever other hotel in the area, like, oh no, that place has the best scrambled eggs, or they have the best omelet bar. <laughs> and it was so fascinating because like his, like what he got kind of high off of was trying to like, just kind of float and be the guy that no one really saw and get those like free meals and cruise with Dude, it was the funniest thing. So some of those stories that he would tell, he's like, oh dude, that hotel in Austin, like killed it. Great breakfast. You're like, dude, you have like this special power of being invisible and just getting into places. It's really cool. It's an, it was an art form. Honestly, this one story keep rising, keeps rising to the top and it was, uh, it was thrift shopping with him in Portland, Oregon. I meet up with him and he comes walking down the street with no shirt on and he's like, super sweaty from being in this like nude sauna. And then he's like, we gotta go to the thrift shop. And we're going to the thrift shop and we go to one that's all bougie and nice. He's like, nah, 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 this is the wrong one. And then we end up like at a more like mom and pop janky one. He's like, yes, this is what's up. I think um, he just loved like getting random shirts at, that had like zero meaning to him, but like would be like something where someone would be like, where did you get that? Um, but he was pretty like bummed at the whole Macklemore like bringing thrift stores to like the common folk because he was like that was my thing. He was the most consistently funny dude I've ever met. 
Yeah, like there's some people that, you know, you have one liners and they're kind of funny. Like this, it was like almost anything he said. It was just so ridiculous and so funny. Zong, what are you calling this one? Call this with a peppermint. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> You know, if people are filming, they'll just jump in and say super random, out of the ordinary things that are hilarious. You're just like, dude, kid's just a good dude, fun vibes. It's, uh, yeah, that's all I always remember, Eric, for sure. So Eric Zahn always likes when I do my little uh, Japanese impersonation. I'm gonna show you right now. Arigato gozaimasu. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Best Japanese voice I've ever I've ever heard. <laughs> I kind of the beginning was like mumble. I was like, "What's going on here?" And then I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> the third time I've heard Ryan McKibben's Japanese voice. <laughs> you fired me up, man. That. I feel like it's just his nature. Like he's just so like mischievous and like kind-hearted, but like wanted to push the envelope and like see how much he could get out of every situation. And just made it fun to be around. He always wanted to cause like just enough trouble to make life fun. That's the thing with Bizarre is like, whenever you hang out with a guy, like it's something's gonna happen where there's gonna be at least one or three new inside jokes from just like that one experience. So. I don't think I have celebrity look like, I just want the world to know that Avery Dross looks exactly like Ellen DeGeneres. So if you, I'd rather have that on there, trying to look alike than me. You guys need to do a segment about that. He beat to his own drum in a way that I had like never met anyone like him. And then getting to know him, it just made perfect sense. He didn't care what anyone thought about him. He just did his own thing. And I think that's what I really admired when I got to know him was just, he was who he was and he was a true character. He was genuine and just did things his way. I didn't care what anyone else thought, which is cool. I started to respect it. I, started, I learned a lesson because of his brashness, because of how unpredictable he was, how random, and just living in the moment he was, doing all these adventurous stuff that sometimes might come across as lewd, crude, whatever. He was still just living. He was living his life without care to what anyone else thought of him, which was amazing quality and is something that I intend to continue that legacy, or at least continue to work on that in myself. Because sometimes I'm prancing around worrying about what others are thinking, you know? And I think a lot of us do. Um, so it's a cool, that's a cool lesson. That's what makes it unique in my eyes. I think he just had like the most unique way of making people feel special. Like I've really never seen it. Like he would, if it was talking to like a random fan or like talking to someone he knew really well, he just like made them feel so special. I don't know if you know this about Eric, but his, his thing was he did not like to smile in pictures. He thought it showed weakness. And my goal was to always try to get him to smile in pictures. I mean, if it got all the way down to like tickling him or whatever it may be. And we got to the top of this mountain and uh, I said something to kind of make Eric smile. And he was at the top of the mountain, happy and smiling. And it's, 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 it's a very memorable thing. And that's, uh, that's how I'm gonna remember him. <clears throat> if you got to know him well, like he loved kids. That was something um, like he joked around about like how he loved babies. He'd be like, oh, I love babies. They're so cute. Like I love holding babies. But like he loved kids too. Uh, he came over to my house the other day, met Micah for the first time. And he, and he held my son Micah, who's only a few months old. And Micah barfed on him. It's classic. And, and you know, he didn't flinch. Like his love of kids revealed this like softness and uh, gentleness that was in his heart. And he was actually a really gentle guy. Like he really was. And, I know he was gnarly and fire on the court sometimes, but he he was a sweetheart, you know, and that it showed in the way he loved kids. He really like made everyone laugh, and uh, and and was really an entertainer, and I think that's like one thing that we don't have a lot of or as much of in our sport anymore is like someone to just really get the crowd going, get people going, like whether it's players or fans or kids or whatever. Um, so it's really good about like hyping up a community. So it's cool. It's a cool takeaway. So I think like the biggest thing that I learned early on is like no judgment. Like I just became like such a more open person. Like right away just from like spending time with him and like 
seeing how, seeing all the layers of him and like how much love he had and how caring he was towards me and like made me feel like the most special person ever. Um, so I think like right then and there, like at the very start, it was just like, wow, like just be in the moment with someone and like take all of what they have in that moment and appreciate it. And like everything that's being said or like small judgments or surface things about people, it like really has no importance in life. Because like if you can share love with someone in like moments, that is what's special. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and our heavenly father and all the angels in heaven, can I get a witness? I want you on your feet as we welcome into the gates of heaven at a Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the ultimate road dog, the one and only, 